everyone and welcome back. This week's video is the start in a small series of working towards making a full ensemble to go with the most gorgeous 1914 vampy, goth, spooky wonderfulness that I am going to reproduce out of Abby's collection. If you haven't seen the video before, she and I got to take a look at it back in October and I am just in love, so very much in love with this garment. It's so beautiful, has so many wonderful details, but that is another video for another day. And I realized that in order to properly have this outfit shown off, it needed to be a full ensemble. I needed the hat, I needed the shoes, I needed it to show up as it would have actually been worn originally. So we are starting today with the hat. Now, 1914 is such a good year for hats. There are so, so many options, and I had a very difficult time choosing what hat I wanted to go with. And in the end, I ended up going to something a little bit more subdued than some of the possible options. While I love the wild and crazy hats, all of the big fabric fans on them and crazy angles and tilted things, I just felt like anything that wild was going to be massive competition for the actual outfit, which was the point of this whole thing. It has this tall pointed collar and all of this embroidery that comes up around the neckline, and I didn't want there to be too much going on. So I wanted to go with a style that was fairly typical for the era, could be very flattering, but very much complemented the outfit rather than competed with it. And I ended up choosing a style which is actually fairly close to a cloche in its general shape, but instead of fitting down over the head like it does in the 1920s, it instead sits on the head and extends upwards, fairly tall. And it usually has a bit of a rounded top, though there are some versions that have flat tops. It has different types of brims, though usually it has a small brim. Sometimes it is very plain, sometimes it's folded up on one side and down on the other. Sometimes it has a bit of shaping to it. There's a whole variety of options within that, and in terms of the fabric coverage and the decorations that are put onto it. But I really liked that style. I thought it would be very flattering for me and for the outfit. The only problem is, while I have made hats before, I've blocked hats, I've made buckram hats and covered them, I honestly don't have a huge background in this, and I've never really had the chance to examine antiques up close to know exactly how they're constructed, and I just didn't want to rush into this without having some basis in how to do this. So I decided one of the ways that I could go about this was to try and find an antique hat that was similar in style to what I wanted to make and use some of the techniques off of that. I managed to find this poor little hat on Etsy, which had at some point in its life been crushed. So it was not the prettiest thing anymore, but it was still in very good condition. And I was able to get a lot of information off of it. I did decide to make some changes to the style. However, I didn't want to use the exact same textiles that they used. Used. I wanted slightly different proportions. I also wasn't going to be doing the plumage in the same way. The original has black heron feathers, but rather than being a single large plume, they're stitched down to a piece of fabric. And I do actually have a black heron plume in my collection that was given to me years ago. And I don't want to cut this thing up for obvious reasons. I want to keep it as it is. I don't collect too many antique feather bits. They're gorgeous. And I think it's a very important item to have in my collection as a discussion point. You see, in the 19 teens, there was a lot of controversy over feathers and hats. Feathers became such a big thing in hats, quite literally, that there was actually an issue of causing the endangerment or even extinction of certain bird species. It wasn't entirely women's hats that did this. There are some other weird circumstances there, but it was a big player in the matter. And there's a reason why the Audubon Society was started up in the 1890s in the US. And there's also a reason why the Federal Migratory Bird Act was put in place in 1918. And this pretty much made all dealings with migratory birds in any part completely illegal buying, selling, owning, didn't matter if it was previous before the act was put into place or after, illegal across the board. 
And this is something that is still standing today and it has been expanded to include non-migratory birds. Now this does specifically apply to American birds, to native birds. So this particular plume of a black heron actually is an African bird. And really a lot of these laws are very much aimed at making sure that they were not dealing with endangered animals. Most of the enforcement of these laws today focuses in on endangered species, which the black heron is from Africa, it is not endangered. And in fact, many of the birds that are on this list are no longer endangered in no small part due to this particular regulation. And it's very important that it's there. And it's also very important that it actually doesn't have any provisions for antique things. That was for a very specific reason. When they did put provision like that in there for ivory, that was when the ivory trade started faking antiques in order to be able to sell new ivory legally. So it's understandable why these things are illegal. You can actually, in some cases, get documentation that allows you to sell and trade these items or to have them for educational purposes, things of that nature. So it's not completely 100% illegal, and it is definitely a gray zone of non-enforcement because technically if you went outside and found a robin eggshell and brought it into your house, that qualifies. So if you do the same thing for pretty much almost any native bird in the United States and brought a feather inside, even if it was dropped naturally, still qualifies. So it's complicated in that format, but it's really meant to be there in order to prevent the issues that they were having with the mass usage of all of these feathers. So they are important to me to have some around as an educational purpose, but it is something that I'm very aware of with my collection. Not that it's a large collection by any means. And one of the things I do for that is that I don't like actually stitching these into the hats. I like to pin them in and move them around from hat to hat so that way they get as much use and life as they can and I can talk about some of these things with people because it is a very important part of fashion in the 19 teens and there is a definite shift in how hats are decorated after that. If you look at hats in the 1920s you don't see lots of plumage on them, you see lots of ribbon decoration and other sorts of crazy trims and in fact you can find lots of hats from around the 1918 1919 point that have these huge pleated chunks of fabric and big bows and so much stuff which very much approximates the overall size and shape of big feather plumes which i think is so very cool and i definitely want to make some of those but again I don't know exactly how they were created and how they were held up. So I wanna do a little bit more research into that before I actually make some of those styles of hats, but I definitely want to make them. And I think that is such a great example of how if you don't want to use feathers, you don't have to. There's so many options out there. And this time period is such a great example of the huge variety of choices that you get when it comes to this very crazy time period. The original hat that I'm copying for its techniques is actually in three pieces. The brim is separate, which I expected, but the crown is actually in two parts as well. There's not only a vertical buckram piece, which is cut on the bias and sort of curves over at the top edge, but the actual domed part of the crown at the top is its own separate piece. For me, this meant that I needed to go ahead and start by shaping some buckram. I wet down some buckram, worked it over a millinery head that I inherited from my grandmother, it stretches really easily, but it's kind of hard to get a smooth edge. So you wanna wrap a tape, just like a twill tape around and pin through that. So that way you have a nice smooth edge that you're aiming towards rather than trying to pin securely through all of those little holes. It shapes out really easily, but it is kind of sticky. So definitely only do it over a surface that you're not concerned with getting that sticky starch onto or maybe cover it in saran wrap. But it's definitely a lot easier if you're able to work the buckram over something that you can pin to. I double checked the height of the original hat once it sort of stretched out. I decided that I wanted to make mine just a little bit taller, but in order to get that curve over the top edge, I needed something that was roughly head shaped and had a flat angle, which the only thing I could really figure out after having wandered about my house for a while was to use the bottom side of my millinery head. It wasn't quite big enough at the bottom as it tapered in, so I wrapped some felt around to get the correct size. I then wet only the very edge of this piece of buckram since the rest of it didn't need to be reshaped. 
and was able to pin that into place and sort of fold and smoosh over that edge, again using the twill tape to help smooth that out. Thankfully for me, I live in the desert and it was a sunny day, so all I had to do was set this block outside for about 15 minutes and everything tried really fast. It was also at this point that I realized that I probably should have put some sort of layer over the felt because, well, the starch from the buckram will stick well to that. And that's not that big of a deal, but uh, next time I'll keep that in mind. I then double checked the measurement for the circumference of the base of the crown. I wanted to give myself some extra space over my actual head measurement because of hairstyles, or in my case, likely a wig. And also knowing that I was going to be wrapping fabric over the edge and that would reduce the circumference slightly. For the top dome, I wanted to double check that it was roughly the right size before I went ahead and trimmed off those corners and trimmed it back into an oval shape. Hats of this style are not generally circular, but oval, which can make the measurement system a little bit complex, but it fits the head much more closely. I was going to use the shape off the original and wanted to create my own style, which was a little bit different. I usually start when creating a brim with some cardstock, and I will draw out the oval shape that is the crown. And in this case, I just drew out a line an inch and a half out for what I thought was going to be about the right size for the brim. The actual shaping of the brim will be done by way of little cuts and darts around the exterior that allow me to shape it either on my millinery head or on my actual head. This sort of gives me a neutral base to start with. I don't want to make it any larger of circumference on the edge, otherwise we're gonna end up with a ruffle. So I know that it needs to be smaller, I just don't know where it needs to be smaller in order to get the shape that I want. So we'll cut all those little tabs around so that way I actually have something to pin to the crown. Worked that down over the buckram crown, pinned it into place, and I started off by doing a little bit of shaping on my millinery head. All I'm doing is cutting little slits into the shape where I want to reduce it, overlapping them slightly and taping them together. This allows me to make small changes as I work my way around the brim, trying to gradually work the shape out that I need. I knew that I wanted one side fairly straight down and the other side up, so I needed to figure out where the reductions needed to occur for that. The first try on was fairly good, it just sat a little bit too far away from the face on the downside, so I adjusted that slightly and tightened it all up a little bit. And then I realized that I might want to actually accentuate that back flip up, so I extended the size past the one and a half inches and tried it out with my plumage. One of the first main steps in construction is basically to finish off the edges of nearly every piece individually. As I mentioned, the dome part on the top is actually separate. It has a wire stitched around the edge and then it is sort of inserted inside of the rest of the crown. I could be doing this by machine, but I really prefer to do most millinery by hand. It just gives me a lot more control over making sure that everything is even. I don't have a specialized sewing machine that allows me to get into the awkward angles to do this correctly, so sometimes it's just easier to do it by hand. I tend to use a cross stitch for most of the work because it's sort of a double stitch that holds everything in place really well. I'm just stitching a bias strip over where the two crown pieces meet since there's a little bit of a rough edge there and I don't want that to show through the fabric in the end. Also stitching a wire on around the bottom of the vertical parts of the crown. 
Like I said, every single piece of this seems to be pretty much finished off individually with a wire somewhere. There's a lot of wires in this thing. Looking at the way that the original was covered, I didn't want to do the exact same technique. They used three different fabrics, a plain black silk, a striped black silk, which you can just barely still see the stripe in, most of it has deteriorated, and then a little velvet band down at the bottom. I wasn't planning on doing this exact same shape and technique, but I was still going to use some of the methods that they used. For one, they cut the pleated silk on the bias, which allows it to sort of curve over that top edge and have a little bit easier time pleating and shaping around the crown. So I cut out my silk satin on the bias and cut out a little oval to fit for the crown. I did also cut some batting to go underneath the little oval that sits on top of the crown. There seemed to be some batting in the original, so I decided to copy that method. Not surprisingly, yet another piece of wire was added here, the bias this time being made up of the silk itself. I basted everything together so that way I could get a nice smooth seam around connecting the oval to the bias piping and to the vertical crown fabric as well. However, I quickly remembered the fact that because this is actually a dome piece that I'm working over, it's got a different circumference than I actually accounted for. So it didn't really gather up right. I tried just gathering it onto the wire to see if that worked and it did not. So I took it all apart and decided to hand stitch it because this was the one thing I was like, I'll just machine stitch this and well, that proved me wrong. So I'm just stitching down the oval carefully. It allows me to regulate the exact amount of gathering and easing so that way it's nice and even around the entire crown. I then checked what, exactly what size the wire needed to be and cut that to shape, then worked the silk bias over that and stitched it down around the top of the crown so that way it was all nice and finished and clean. to cover my brim top and bottom with the silk satin just because that's something I have a fair amount of. And the velvet that I wanted to use for the decoration on the crown is actually a pane velvet that's very, very napped. So it was not something that I could easily cut this very awkward shape out of and have all the directions for the nap correct. So I decided to cut both sides out of the silk satin so that wouldn't be an issue. Again, the brim is finished off with a wire edge around the exterior and there will be actually another piece of piping around the edge afterwards, which has wire in it as well. So it actually has two wires going around the exterior of the brim. First, the top fabric is actually folded over the initial wired edge and then we will add the piping and face the bottom.
I wasn't really sure if I was going to get the proportions right for all of my decoration on the crown, so I went ahead and threw the brim on really fast and tried out the proportions. They're pretty close, but it was a little top heavy, so I decided to repleat the silk part of the crown ever so slightly, and I actually decided to add a little bit of batting underneath the velvet as well, so that way it would stick out and have a little bit more substance to it. the brim are finished pretty independently of each other and just very loosely stitched together on the original. I did a much finer stitch just for security and my own peace of mind. But they sort of utilize stitching down the trim as a double way of stitching the whole thing together. After this was done, the very last step is to go ahead and line it, which is done in a silk taffeta on the original. They do have another piece of piping, but it's a silk covered cord, which I don't have something similar to, and it didn't seem like it was absolutely necessary for the actual function of the piece. So I went ahead and ignored that and just gathered up a straight tube of fabric to a small oval. I did find that the oval for the lining was actually smaller than the oval for the exterior of the crown, but it doesn't seem to necessarily follow a specific placement or reason for that. In the original hat, this plumage is sort of stitched down onto a separate piece of fabric where each feather is stitched individually. So though it looks like one large chunk of plumage, it's actually a whole bunch of little individual staves and it's made to just look very full by stitching it onto this piece of fabric. 
the piece that I have is not quite the same shape or style, so I decided to use a slightly different placement and shape for this reason. 